All right, this I'm making a video. <laughs> yeah, draft science presentation or draft physics, whatever you choose. Um, DraftPhysics.com actually works. Um, if interested, um, speaking of other websites, I did read a Miles Mathis um, article on the second LIGO discovery, the one that took a hundred seconds or whatever it is, three hundred, yeah, you know, hundred seconds. Anyway. <laughs> It's bad for so many reasons. And so he just outlined some of the reasons. And yes, he relies on some semantics here and there, like pointing out where they said a new star was born. And uh, theoretically, obviously, that couldn't have happened. Um, it was a supernova. And it's not a star. It's a dead star, uh, uh, effectively. Um, but whatever. So that's almost just semantics. Uh, but the whole idea of seeing it, you know, 180 million light years away and all that kind of crap is just crap. Um, and, you know, noticing what was there and what isn't there and all that kind of shit. But anyway, um, just so much crap to this whole LIGO thing. So I, I'm not, I don't agree with all of his arguments. I don't agree with his charge theory as a counter explanation or any of that. I just thought it was a, some of it was just a good pointing out that, you know, this is rubbish for a lot of reasons. Uh, the thing I didn't know is there, you know, the the two LIGO things in America, the European one couldn't see it, and that was, you know, by default seeing it because it was in their blind spot kind of nonsense. Well, anyway, but the two that did see it in America, the one of them saw it right in the middle of a glitch, <laughs> which really. I mean, that's even more reason to say, oh yeah, so now you can tell the difference between your signals and your glitches, and uh, it's just, it's so bad. So, on the subject of so bad physics, um, I just figured I'll make this a, a introductory video to the, the most basic of the arguments um, in terms of the descriptions of all force mechanics by conventional physics, and the fact that all of it is unaccountable um, in terms of there's no explanation for where the energy comes from for any of it and um, the forces are not even <coughs> have the same modality they function completely differently um, in spite of the fact that they have things like the inverse square law and uh, the speed in common so they move the same speed and they generally obey uh, a version of the inverse square law um, in terms of how they function in discrete ways and you know in the sense that they are um, excreted in a radiant form either very directly radiant <laughs> or spread radiant um, <clears throat> so um, this is to me like the most glaring reason to be kind of suspect is the, you know these huge contradictions no source of no explanation for what the real origin of movement is um, you know, this most basic function in the universe just not explained at all. Just magical virtual things do it. It's either the virtual form of the bent space, which is just another virtual force, or the literal virtual photon that they blame for uh, magnetic effects and for the strong and weak nuclear forces all the interactions between uh, electrons and protons essentially all movement of electrons and protons are because of some virtual thing except when they blame light which they don't call a force which is also just kind of bizarre why isn't light in the force category <laughs> instead of its own category it moves the same exact speed as the forces uh, yet no one calls it what it is a force um, and one that we can actually interact with quite directly. Um, so, you know, all kinds of reason to say this whole idea of an electromagnetic spectrum is separate from, you know, the thing we call it electric and magnetic. And magnetic, there's no electric, but anyway, <laughs> you know, um, you know it's, it's just, it's awful. Physics is a mess. And it's all so weakly evidenced, and so that's the other argument here, is this kind of mistake might be justifiable 
if there was a huge pile of evidence, you know, that there's some mechanical mechanism that's contracting space, or that there are, um, that virtual photon is a legitimate concept, you know, that you don't have to actually say, oh, well, if we're going to say it's some sort of force bit, then we should say it's a force bit, and we should say it's a real thing, and account for it, and account for where it came from, and why it's there, and how it functions. And if they just did that little step, I would sort of argue that once they concede that things have to exist, and they have to account for where they came from, then they might draw the conclusion that, well, maybe we can just think of all the matter bits as just being filters, and they all filter for different things. Magnetism filters based on polarization and, um, you know, things that produce or interact with light filter based on frequency, you know, how rapidly the little bits are coming, and that all of this is just filtering a medium and the medium is where the energy comes from, is the origin of it, the tons, the bits. Um, you know, it just seems kind of obvious. I mean, like I said, if we're going to use the word virtual photon, why didn't they use the word vi virtual wave time, or virtual wavelet, or virtual perturbation, or virtual something like that? No, well, it's because they kind of know that it's it's moving, it's doing the photon thing, it's it's imitating a photon, it's going in a straight line most all of the time except when you shove a bunch of material things around it and affect it by interacting with it directly. So I'm already kinda off my um, script but whatever. I do have talking points on the side here, on the side there, uh, over there, yes, it's over there. Um, so yeah, I'll post the link to the Miles Masses. Um, like I said, I don't agree with him, but I agree. I, I, I mean, he, like I said, I agree with the parts where he's pointing out errors, and I don't agree with every error he points out, but regardless, I'm just saying, you know, when you just start thinking about all the levels of bullshit, and you're saying there's just nobody scrutinizing any of this. Everybody just eats it up. They say, we did it, and everybody just says, great, fantastic and nobody questions any of it and it's like there's so many things to question all right so um as stated these this is the first i think in a which will be a series of um compiling the arguments for why there needs to be a new start where why you kind of have to go backward a bit and undo some of the wrong presumptions. So the first thing I say is the first step to getting the right answer is avoiding wrong answers. So like putting a puzzle together or a connected dots thing, once you start going wrong, you've already damaged right. You know, you can't you can't fix it because you use things in the wrong way and now you can't use them again, that kind of thing. And, you know, the whole wrong track thing, there's so many ways to metaphor it. But the most important thing scientists should be trying to do is avoid those kind of mistakes in building the foundation of their physics or their theory. And, you know, once you put bad bricks in and, you know, crooked, go in the wrong direction, all that kind of stuff, it's going to create problems later. And... So this really should be important, that your foundational presumptions about waves and what forces are creating force and how force is being manifested and all this, this is really important. And when you have overt contradictions, where essentially you're forgetting that the universe is one place, and you're sort of saying big things can function one way and little things will function another way, and we'll have all kinds of rules for everything that's different, that should be like a kind of a giveaway that you're probably on the wrong track that you know mechanically the universe is one thing and we know that the just as I know my body is made out of cells billions of them and that they're being manipulated by the physics the chemistry and that the chemistry is being manipulated by the physics it just goes you know the function is always nuclear the universe is the, the <laughs> you know <laughs> It's <clears throat> the little universe is the universe, and we only see, you know, uh, the medium and the big, in a sense. You know, it's very hard to see the small. <clears throat> so we only have a view 
<clears throat> of you know what it looks like after you pile a whole bunch of junk together and make it kind of complicated um, and so it can look different but we should understand that that's the truth the truth is there isn't a human being there's a bunch of cells right? a colony of cells and that there's a liver and there's a pancreas and there's all kinds of different organs that are doing specific things that they've been built to do and it's you know I am a collection of parts um, the whole doesn't do anything the parts do it all without the part without the brain there's no conversation there's no you know I wouldn't be making this video um, the parts are integral they're the function and it goes all the way down <clears throat> to this basic uh, elemental function so that's another it's a point where I don't know if you have to make a declaration about how far down it goes but I think you can understand that there's a point you go down to where you get kind of planky where you get kind of it's all or nothing it's either on or it's off um, and there's no in-betweens um, and the universe does seem seems to be some evidence for that because I don't think this is one of those I don't think that's one of the decisions that matters the decisions that matter are things like bent space-time um, as a as a source of energy as a magical mechanism of movement you know where no nothing required you know just the inverse square law which is how all the other fun how all the other forces actual ones function all the things we actually declare as a real thing um, it can have all these real thing properties but it doesn't have to be obedient to any other checks on its function because it doesn't it, we're not declaring it a real thing so it doesn't have to account for itself in any way it's just free energy free movement free physics from you know and it's just God of the gaps I mean that's not in here in the text <laughs> but uh, that's all this is um, alright so you start with the push-pull argument which is kind of an obvious argument that pulls are always complicated as a description this idea of something having to reach out and pull is complicated you need complex structure to do pulls where pushes are just too easy you know one thing bangs into another thing and I would argue that forces are pushing and so that what the real game is is just moderating pressure it's just um, <sighs> Ken Wheeler would agree that it, uh, this is all the universe is doing it's, it's, it's pressurized and the bits inside are shielding each other from pressure in different ways just like our, my body does that it deals with air pressure and it deals with the internal um, velocities and everything else and you know can't make corners too too tight you can't <laughs> it has to obey the rules <clears throat> of what pressure means and what velocity means and acceleration means and um, <clears throat> it's all in the physical structure but it's all different places with different kinds of pressure, different kinds of attraction and repulsion. And I would argue the attraction is just the absence of the push. You know, it's a, a low pressure creating a pressure imbalance, and everything is just a byproduct. So all movement is just a byproduct of a pressure imbalance. Should be in there, but it's probably not. But that's all it is. When you see something move, it's because there's something more on one side of it than there is on the other side of it, in a sense, or inside of it itself, inside its front end, between its front end and its, its back end, there's a difference in the pressure. All right, so um, all right, so no source of energy for magnetism, gravity, or the nuclear forces. I mean, this is just glaring. They're all just synthetic things completely unaccessible um, they don't have any generating theory any theory of where they come from so the magnetic force is just it's just there just poof and the nuclear forces uh, things moving uh, protons and electrons together and electrons and electrons apart it's just you know no accounting for where it comes from it's just some sort of magical energy that 
doesn't have to be accounted for because in theory um, it's yin and yang. <laughs> you know, if you if you expand somewhere, then you contract somewhere else. So because the force is conservative, they can always pretend they don't have to account for it because you won't have anything left over because every time it yins, it yangs somewhere, and they understand that much. But they don't have any accounting for how the accounting is done. How how does the universe know that it it um, contracted so much, it, it, it um, created so much, I don't even know how you describe the bent space thing in, in rational terms, it contracted space so much, and that later it's going to have to expand space so much, um, you know, to uh, expel something, um, or to take energy away from something that it gave energy to. And in, the, in theory, so the point is, is they make a they they turn something as simple as the inverse square law, which just is a radiant force, and because it gets weaker as it goes further away, and they just invert it into a bowl. They just make it into a graph going this way. This is strong here, and it's weak out here, and they just cut that in half, make it a bowl, and say there, there's gravity, and we don't have to do anything more. We turned it into a visual shape of a well, therefore we're done. Um, no physics required. <laughs> you know, so they just take an observed effect, create a synthetic cause, and then say somehow, see how the cause creates the effect. See, it's just like the inverse square law. Yeah, because you invented it. By looking at the inverse square law, you wouldn't have invented it that way. You wouldn't have made it that way if you didn't know what rules it had to obey. So you just conform something to your your uh, known requirements, and then claim that your your shape predicted, you know, the thing you built it out of the the observation that I mean you drew the duck because you saw a duck you didn't invent duck, but, you know it's just that kind of obvious, um, and it's just huge reason to be suspect to say. These are sort of extraordinary claims, okay, that somehow the space does geometry and it somehow, like I said, it's just by some magical way, space is altered by a mass just sitting there. A mass just sits here. There, I'm a mass, and all of a sudden it's altering space. And there's no explanation for how this mass knows how to do that. Or where did it get that function from? And in every other case where something creates a force, a repulsion, um, we know it has to be something that comes out of it. Like if it's burning and it's shedding the force of light, we know the light has to come from somewhere. The, the bits are in the thing and it has to burn them. It has to expel them. They're not virtual anymore. They're real things, not fake things. Uh, yeah. So... Um, all right. uh, no source of energy for magnetism, gravity, and nuclear force. So again, just no uh, magnets, for example. You know, doing all this turning and they you know, to, to meet each other, and then they attract and then they repel. All of the force, all of that action, and they don't have any. Where did the energy come from? No real photons to push things into each other. No real photons to push things apart from each other. Nothing real, not a nothing. No, <laughs> you know, it's not even a pull. Well, you know, if we could make a pull, I don't know. Again, how would what would a pull be? But a God reaching out and pulling. There's no, there's no pull. There's no pull energy. What would, would that be? What would be a pull energy? It just, it has, it's so distant from any kind of thing we observe everywhere around us. We know that this just doesn't do stuff. Stuff has to interact with it. Real stuff, not virtual stuff. Uh, anyway. um, Alright, so, um, so I already pointed out the inverse square law, but so these are the things you have in common, right? You have all these forces have the same speed, and it happens to be the speed of light, which is a huge giveaway, right? Real photons. I mean, okay, yes, they've made them very unreal in the sense that now they say they don't know where they are, they don't have a location, 
and they create multiverses and they do all kinds of but let's just say that for the sake of argument let's go back a little further and just say you no know, we just know them as discrete bits corpuscles of energy uh, that move the speed of light and generally speaking go very straight rays of light and the this ray function is what everything else is doing. It's raying, and that's where the inverse square law comes from. The inverse square law is basically saying that something is spreading in both directions. That's the inverse square law. So if I'm spreading my force in both directions in little rays, you can understand that the further away I am, the less of those rays that are going to hit you, because most of them are going to miss you. And the closer you get, the more of those rays are going to hit you. And that's one of the foundational observations in physics about how forces function. It's why this hand gets four times bigger when I move it just half the distance. It's because of these rays of light. And there's just so many fewer out here than there are here. Um... All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The forces all appear to travel at the same constant speed. So again, should be a huge giveaway. Should say it to everybody. Well, we really should match gravity to the virtual photons that are doing magnetism because they're going the same speed, and the nuclear forces they're doing the same thing. So it's just light and light. So so you have all these things moving at exactly the same speed, and to have completely different methods of action for things going exactly the same speed I mean that just that's a that's a bell saying we're we're going the wrong way we're connecting the wrong dots I mean it seems probable that you're connecting wrong dots and unless you have really strong evidence to connect those wrong dots I mean really really glaringly strong evidence like Bugs Bunny's buck teeth or something or his ears or something. <laughs> you know, some reason to know it. Oh yeah, those are rabbit ears. They don't have that. This is really cloudy. Foggy. And there's just no reason to sit there and have that as the presumption. The presumption should be you have to make these the same force. Your theory should be able to combine these two events. Uh, the Earth moving towards the Sun and uh, magnets moving towards each other and the fact that they're doing it based on the same force migration the fact that it's induced at the same rate in a Maxwellian way just is a huge giveaway that somehow these forces can't be fundamentally created by fundamentally different things All right. so the speed of light is the speed of force so again this is just one of those things where <coughs> The, these are the easy things for physics to fix. Like having the plus sign and the minus sign wrong, <laughs> you fix these things. You just don't leave them broken forever. Um, and this is one of the things that should be fixed by now. Now that we know all these forces travel the same speed, the speed of light shouldn't be called the speed of light. It should be called the speed of force. To keep everybody aware of the fact that all of these little virtual things, including bent space, migrates, progresses at exactly the same speed. And that's good reason to think this stuff must be the same thing, not different things. And the fact that light moves the same speed as the virtual photons and moves the same speed as gravity should be tied together. Uh, I'm just saying it doesn't have to be true. I'm just saying that's where you have to, you have to prove it not true first. Because it it's just sits out and says, you know, you have to deal with this. All right. Um, same rules for the entire universe. That's so just getting back to the point that it's the tiny universe, the empty space between the protons and the electrons is exactly the same empty space as between Mars and Uranus. It's, it's all the same space and the stuff in between the space, the matter clumps, it's the same matter clump, all right, but they have a different function when they're in different states of purity, so to speak. We know there's a hundred or so elements, 
you know the atoms themselves are configured different you can have compounds and complex arrangements of those atoms and um, but underneath it all it's all the same space versus matter and the thing called force is communicating between the matter the matter moves because the force changes and when the force changes the matter moves and the matter can move as I stated because it's got the force inside of it and it's got an imbalance in the force inside of it all right um, <clears throat> So next was all action is nuclear. Um, so again, it's just saying the same thing. Gravity is not a big thing for us. It's moving the little tiny bits. All the little bits are being moved by gravity. It's not moving just atoms. It's not moving molecules. It's not moving big things. It's moving every little tiny bit of matter. And that's what moves. And that's what, again, has to be accounted for. And it might not be every bit of matter. It might just be protons that it's moving. <laughs> you know, and things without protons maybe aren't going to be affected by gravity. Uh, I mean, uh, neutrons. Um, you know, that might be the truth. Uh, that those bits only move when they have an association to a neutron. Uh, you know, nobody really accounts for the function of neutrons and atoms, but they might be the bit like the Higgs boson that's really doing all the gravitational work all right. but at any rate anything that moves anything that happens all of this it all originates with nuclear functions with subatomic streams of energy being shot between electrons and protons and the atoms that they're part of and that's where it all starts in terms of the force interactions. Um, all the big actions are a consequence of the combining of a bunch of little actions. All right, should be understood as filters, not sources of energy. So this is more my counter argument that here you have a perfectly viable method of connecting these dots where you, you know you don't have to just say we can't connect them again it's this whole idea of first do no harm first don't get the wrong answer so we're sitting here with this these dots to connect and they're starting to connect them into multiverses and wave functions and bent space and nothing has a position and uncertainty principles and uh, entanglement and all kinds of stuff and my argument is is you know, first, don't make mistakes. So if you undo all that and you just sit there and say, okay, let's do nothing, I'm not arguing that that's all you can do. But I will suggest that there are um, foundational bricks here that I think are kind of solid, that it might be a good test to go out there and put down a few of these foundational bricks, connect a few dots, and say, well, what does it look like the, the universe is doing? In the sense that you can understand if you start turning everything into a filter and saying it's filtering some force on the outside and depending on how the force comes in or what force comes in it comes out is either movement by the matter bit or the matter bit expels it as some kind of other force it converts it so light can go in as ultraviolet light into some things and it can reflect off as infrared or it can cause heat well, infrared same difference or movement it can do lots of different things, or electricity, uh, the movement of electrons. And it's because of its arrangement, so it filters it that way. And as I've pointed out, if you think of magnets as filters, no energy inside of them at all, no energy production, no swirling bits going all around, all this complex stuff. No, they're just energy comes in in one form, and it comes out filtered. Uh, same energy. It's just rerouted, so the stuff that's black or polarized one way, and the stuff that's polarized another way, take two different directions. So it just filters it. And that if you think of protons and electrons, they're just the same thing. They're just filters. This one filters for black, and this one filters for red. It filters for polarization this way and polarization this way, however you want to think about the two types. But it filters the bits into 
type. And there's only two types of bits. But anyway, so I think it's a perfectly viable way of understanding why matter moves and why different kinds of matter moves differently is because it's a different kind of filter. It filters a little different because it's configured a little different. Um, but it's, uh, I think, a, it would be a powerful foundational brick for physics to just recognize that that's all there really is. There's force in a chaotic mixed form of two types all mixed up and that the matter bits filter that force in different ways creating in the case of the electromagnetic spectrum little bits at a frequency and in the case of magnetism little bits segregated by a feature like polarization and also in the case of the nuclear bits the protons and electrons which I would argue that another foundational brick might be let's assume electrons and protons are the magnetic monopoles that they're the filter inside the magnet which is perfectly consistent with so much experimental data all right that it's all about the position of electrons and protons that decide whether something's magnetic whether it's producing filtered energy magnetism magnetism is just filtered energy all right <clears throat> should be understood as filters not sources of energy so yeah, I just did that they absorb their movement from movement already in the environment so the movements in the environment in the form of the force bits little things so two types let's say so again this is just what I'm saying works as a theory I think is a good foundation but they could modify it they could have five bits or ten bits <laughs> if they need to add more um, but it's stuff moving the speed of light and the matter bits aren't moving the speed of light <laughs> and when a force bit hits a matter bit it can move the matter bit one percentage the percentage of this photon hitting this it'll move this the speed of light one photon worth spread over its entire mass so it'd be a tiny little bit these are spreading one tiny force over a huge amount of force it's like my finger pushing a Mack truck. It's not going to push it very far. Um, but the force is real, and the impacts are real, and if you increase the force, you increase the capacity to move the truck and how fast the truck will move. So this is stuff we observe in the environment. We see all this stuff happening all the time. So we know what a car wreck is. We know what it's like to push a car out of the mud. We know what, how force works and there's no reason to say all of that knowledge from personal experience is somehow just useless intuitive nonsense when it's experiential and it has um, there's every reason to think we're not in some special piece of the universe where special things happen that the stuff that happens in our level of the universe can be accounted to the small universe as its source into the big universe as a simplification of it. Yeah. I mean, the big universe is quite obviously, in many respects, the craters on the moon. I mean, it's quite obviously very interactive. Uh, it's quite obvious the moon doesn't get a crater unless an asteroid hits it. You know, it's quite obvious you don't blow a big chunk of Mars off of Mars and it hurls all the way to the Earth and lands as a little asteroid unless there was a force that made that happen so even though those those impacts are really nuclear reactions taking place on the subatomic level little individual atoms are getting interacting in, in brutally harsh ways and creating all kinds of energy and you know heat and all kinds of stuff and melting and doing all kinds of different things because of the amount of force involved um, it all comes down to just being that, just a nuclear reaction and um, perfectly accountable, perfectly conservative. We account for where the energy comes from. We don't think the big universe does something without accounting for the energy, except, like I said, the theory of gravity. <laughs> you know, but anyway, 
Um, so I don't know if I want to get into waves. This really isn't the argument, um, the wave theory part, because I'm more focused on just the energy part. But the fact that they think of waves uh, or frequency as being something that increases energy when it just increases the amount of energy per unit of time. So, you know, three things going is more energy per unit of time. But it's not more absolute energy in the sense that the little bits don't have any extra energy. It's just that you have more of them hitting in a unit of time. Um, so, you know, this is a... I mean, it's kind of an obvious explanation to say, well, look, it's silly to say a certain form of light has more energy intrinsically when it doesn't intrinsically have more over if you give enough time you can send to more ultraviolet if you just send one little burst of blue light versus a long amount of red light the total amount of energy is more for the red light the total number of impacts but as I pointed out as I have pointed out it's kind of obvious you can understand that things get tipped you know there's reactions based on speed and you could you can throw a rock at something you know and as long as you keep allowing it to you know you can tilt it and if you don't throw another rock until it settles and then you throw another one and it settles you'll never tip it over but if you threw two rocks while this was still leaning you'll tip it over that's that's it's an appearance of more energy it's not more energy uh, so I mean, either like, you know, like I said this is physics. It should be a little bit stringent and tight, and um, you know the conclusion should be really kind of unassailable. And the whole idea of converting frequency into a an energy function is so easily assailed as getting that one wrong. <laughs> you know, misunderstanding what you're seeing. The fact that it tipped over didn't mean that it got hit by more energy. Think of it as bullets. I could fire 25 bullets at it, just slowly. And then I could just shoot two and knock it over. You know the bullets didn't have more energy. You know, they're all the same. Came from the same gun. There's no difference in the bullets. There was no more energy. There was actually less energy. And we shot two. Um, it's just that the effect is different because of the timing. All right. So that's enough on <coughs> wave theory, I think, for now. All right. Electrons and protons can't hold velocity. They can only explicitly accelerate for an explicit moment. So this is all, you know, it's very complicated. Um, all the, this is another problem in physics, is that it's hard for the, anyone to challenge the authorities because they have such complex uh, machinery and data uh, you know it goes you know look at the Hadron Collider for example you know 25 tons of instrumentality to see a, an electron um, take a picture of it take a picture of its impact on a blob of jello frozen jello um, <coughs> so anyway, I'm just see, but that's the level of it, right? We think these are, we see one of these images from the collider and we say, oh, that's an image of an electron, when it really isn't. It's an image of an electron causing the release of photons as it travels through ions. It's not really the image of the thing itself. It's an image of the mess it made on its way going where it was going. Um, so I just made this argument in just a video recently, but I'm just saying, so you have all these levels of information and that their conclusions are based on and you know there's no um, fair way to to um, detail or, or substantiate the credibility of all the assumptions that are built into that 25 tons worth of instrumentality all kinds of assumptions about what they're really seeing and none of that is thoroughly tested and it's almost impossible to test it without becoming fluent in all of the theory and all of the mechanics of all the devices that underlie it. Um, so there's probably a good analogy for this kind of thing where um, you know there's one thing to fix software problems with a computer it's another thing to fix hardware problems with a computer 
you know, it's just that the levels of expertise you have to be to get to the real source um, of the data, what the data really represents, could be incredibly extensive. You'd have to have degrees in many fields to actually be able to fairly judge one experiment. Um, <clears throat> so that makes all of this, you know, very difficult to attack experimental data that's that um, complicated. And uh, but you do have the alternative of going after their more fundamental experiments, like their interferometers or their two slits or diffraction gradients or you know other simple mechanisms for which they say simple functions, um, polarizing film, lots of things that you can get to. So some of their data is accessible to critique. Some of it, you know, realistically, um, it's difficult to attack because of the number of layers of technology and black boxes, so to speak, little magic black boxes that do little magical things in the experiment that haven't been um, tested to any kind of authority. You know, they're not they're not proven to do what they claim they can do. All right. Um, uh, so force bits have no, let's see, um, connected tension. Yes, that's the wave part. Um, so it's sort of consistent with the argument I just made. You know, a wave of photons is as wrong as saying a wave of bullets because there's nothing connecting the individual bullets to each other. It's not like water molecules. It's not a medium. But they can look like a wave. But looking like and being like two different things. All right, electrons and protons can't hold velocity. I already did. Uh, forces don't interact with forces. So this is one of the fundamental curiosities. Um, these are tricky parts of the dots to connect. Is this idea that these things will interact with matter? If there's a matter, it'll hit it, and if it's not matter, it'll not hit it. <laughs> and that's a that's an interesting fact. Um, that the force has to get to a piece of matter to have an impact and that the forces can't just repel each other they have to get to the surface uh, uh, the, for the gravity to have an effect it has to get to your material substance and for the gravity you produce to have an effect on something your force of gravity has to get to the thing and that's another reason not to believe in virtuals um, is the fact that the force actually does have to get there. Um, so all force, um, yeah, force affects matter, matter affects force. So force would be irrelevant in the universe if it wasn't for the matter bits because the force bits wouldn't do anything terribly interesting because they mostly miss each other. And matter wouldn't do anything without the force bits to move it around. So the two of them are their they're essential um, for the function of the universe. <laughs> uh, that's sort of obvious, but I just mean it really is that one of them creates all of the movement, one of them creates all of the substance, so to speak. Um, all right. So all velocity originates with the velocity of force. So I, I would argue that it's the speed of these little force bits, the speed of light, that is in the function of all speed. So all speed is essentially the absorption of something else's momentum in a direction. So you get hit by more stuff from one side than the other side and you move. Um, and essentially to keep moving you somehow have to not only get hit by it but you have to collect that potential and have it keep pushing you along. Um, but that's the nature of all velocity is the capture of momentum in a direction, capturing the force. Um, so force is pressure, so, so we're going back to the beginning where the whole thing has to really, it, it just, it's, it's, those dots connect very well in that most everything looks like that. It can be modeled like that. If you model gravity like that, it's called mock gravity, it comes out, does the inverse square law perfectly. Um, you know, it's pressure, and everything's just shielding something from the pressure. And if the pressure was behind me and it was pushing me, and it's a straight line force, 
then this thing in front of me would be immune to the substance of that pressure and there'd be nothing hitting it this way still have stuff hitting it this way so it would move towards me because there's an absence of the balancing force the balance is lost when they become in proximity to each other and that's the nature of what we see in most of the interactions all around us um, okay gravity is induced um, it's kind of a complex argument no need to go into it I suppose but it's uh, the fact is is that for for you to change the pressure you have to absorb it you know you have to consume it it has to <laughs> has to move you um, for you to stop it you have to essentially keep it inside of you spinning in a circle so if you thought a force is something that goes and then when something catches it it's going in a circle so it's not going anywhere anymore so it doesn't get to this other thing you know then you get the idea of the imbalance and the pressure so for something when something does that when something captures force in a trap and it doesn't get to this thing this thing says I got more pressure over here than I got over here and it captures force from this side more than it captures force from this side because there is more so it's just a probability equation the odds are it'll capture more going this way than it will capture going this way because there's more over here so it will move and then when it moves it that means it captured a force it's captured the momentum and that's induction and we see that in magnets and um, and that's Einstein's contribution essentially to gravity was to take that induction math and make it into a, a, a gravity field equation alright gravity is a nuclear force so again it's not affecting atoms it's not affecting molecules it's not affecting whole bodies it's affecting the little bits the little bits are the ones getting pulled more accurately pushed by gravity um, so it's an, uh, gravity is an external pressure capable of being shadowed which means to shadow means to absorb to consume uh, gravity is the absorption of imbalance so there's more on one side than the other side you absorb more from that side that simple uh, to change its direction a photon must interact with a matter bit so this gets, gets to theories about what photons are and what force is and force just doesn't interact with force so the theory that light is the force of light is bent by the force of gravity is totally inconsistent with every other force known in the universe no other forces will do that you can't make magnetism bend light you can't make um, any kind of radiation bend another form of radiation so to speak uh, radiation in terms of force radiation so that's probably not true and there's good reason to believe it's not true because the evidence is really really has a lot of contradictions in it a lot of uh, gaps and it's really thin evidence of a real effect the, the, the evidence of a real effect is thin and the evidence that it may be a wrong theory is big because there's lots of circumstances where we know the lensing should happen and it doesn't All right. um, to change its direction a photon oh, I did that I think must interact with a matter bit uh, magnetism is a force behind all electrical phenomena so this is a point I have made before too but this is a dot brick again a foundational brick that I just think physics would do itself a big favor by recognizing that yes the proton and the electron are the magnetic monopoles and this thing we call electric is really movement of electrons and electrons only move because they're magnetic because they're doing a repulsion and attraction thing based on their repulsive to uh, each other the electrons just as a magnets repulsive if you have them pointed the same way and uh, they're attracted to the protons just like a magnet is attractive when you switch and it's exactly the same kind of function 
and it's the movement of electrons that we call an electrical phenomenon but it really doesn't have anything the underlying force the force that moves the electrons is magnetism all right the idea of an electric magnetic field uh, is not compatible with the idea of bent space-time so it's just kind of an obvious argument back to the original argument which is you have all these consistent elements to these forces and yet you're going to say they're not consistent they're created by fundamentally different things it just seems um, that that would be unlikely that they could have so many things in common and yet be completely different forms of life or something um, you know there, there's just too many similarities to think of this as completely different mechanisms all right so probably enough for volume one but there's reason to have argument here so I mean I am still searching for anyone who will who wishes to debate these points of conventional physics um, I mean I could talk to some of the other ether kooks and, and whatnot but I just don't know if there's any point in me arguing counter theories that are you know in some ways just as convoluted and made up as the theory I have to the, the one that's in place the, the one that needs to be dethroned um, so I'd rather try to have discussion with somebody who believes that space-time is the correct interpretation that Fo Heisenberg is a reasonable understanding that uh, things don't have a exact position in space that you know all of this wave theory the quantum mechanics and the bent space-time ideas I mean I didn't even go into the time thing but because I wanted to focus on just the energy part but again it's just completely tiny bits of evidence a little bit of an association between velocity and time dilation and it's converted into this whole like somehow it's the bending of space that's warping time when no gravity creates acceleration and acceleration even when you're not moving that is even when you're stopped on the surface of the earth you're still being accelerated at 10 meters per second per second your little bits are still moving down and the problem is the earth is pushing back up and that's why you feel it that's why we feel gravity it's not because nothing's doing anything we feel it because things are doing a lot of stuff that's why we feel it so we're bouncing in the gravity which is essentially velocity I mean if you just bounce the ball in a forward direction you can see its velocity and that the ball travels so the the speed of the ball isn't how fast it's going this way the speed of the ball is how much distance it travels total so the ball is going much faster than what you see as its velocity a bouncing ball all right so that's probably enough I think so but anyway so open invitation to anybody you know comment anything we would like to do some live rooms where they'll defend the evidence, point to it, even whatever, force me to go read some papers or whatnot. I'll do it. Um, you know, to make this argument that somehow you have heavy, strong, decisive evidence where physics should be entitled to close the subject and just say the foundation is built. We're building on it. We're not going back. <laughs> we're we're not going to put real cement in. We're not going to do any of that. You know, you think it's all plastic and, and shitty? Um, too bad. Um, because we're not going to be subjected to any inspection, any critique whatsoever. You know, it's, you know, and, and that's just, I don't think that can be rationally defended um, in, in light of the incredible thinness, weak, veneer of evidence it's not a bulk of evidence it's not a preponderance of evidence it's not a ton of evidence it's nothing like that it's a little tiny little observations and and um, you know bent by their own prejudice I would argue to create a more phantasmagorical universe um, and it's it's, it's 
I don't think it has any chance that conventional physics has the right answer for the reason I have pointed out. Just too many inconsistencies um, with reasonable probabilistic uh, likelihoods. Um, no reason to think two completely different functional forces would migrate through space at the same speed. That kind of thing. Anyway, till the next time and such.